The next phase in the war in Ukraine is now apparent. Over the next few weeks and months, Russian forces will try to expand control of their occupied territories in eastern Ukraine and dig in. The Ukrainian army and people will resist fiercely, and low-grade battles will likely persist in these areas, as they have in Donbass since 2014. That means the only way out of this conflict is to put enough pressure on Russia to force it to the negotiating table and seek sanctions relief in exchange for a peace deal. To achieve this, the coalition against it needs the staying power to maintain and even ratchet up sanctions and embargoes against Moscow. And that is only conceivable in a scenario in which energy prices come down from their current highs. If oil prices remain over $100 a barrel, and they could easily go much higher, Europe will soon enter a recession, and the entire global economy will see a drop-off of growth and political backlash against the sanctions. This would almost certainly mean the collapse of the coalition against Russia, as countries would search for ways to gain cheaper energy. That is surely Vladimir Putin's hope. The only plausible path to keep the pressure on Russia while not crippling the global economy is to get oil prices down. And the only sustainable way to do this is to get the world's largest swing producer, Saudi Arabia, as well as other Gulf states, such as the UAE and Kuwait, to increase production of oil. American oil production is expanding as fast as it can. There are other paths worth trying, such as easing the embargo on Venezuela and returning to the Iran nuclear deal. But the Gulf states can easily expand production by millions of barrels a day and keep those supplies flowing well into the future. Yet despite several entreaties by the United States, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have refused to significantly increase production. And that brings us to the central issue, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. In the past, Biden has called Saudi Arabia a pariah. He has yet to hold a formal meeting with bin Salman. In return, MBS, as he's often called, has refused American requests to increase oil production and has moved to strengthen his relations with Russia and China. In a soon-to-be-published Council on Foreign Relations special report, Stephen Cook and Martin Indyk propose a grand bargain in which the U.S. would improve relations with the MBS and make more explicit pledges to protect Saudi Arabia in return for a series of Saudi moves from ending the war in Yemen to recognizing Israel to taking more explicit responsibility for the murder of journalist and Washington Post contributing columnist Jamal Khashoggi. It is an idea worth taking seriously and expanding to include the UAE, other Gulf states, and Egypt. Despite their surface disagreements with Washington, all these countries want more solid American guarantees regarding their security in an increasingly unstable Middle East. The Saudis were distressed that after the 2019 drone attacks on their oil facilities by Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen, the Trump administration did practically nothing to retaliate. The UAE faced a similar attack in January and was likewise distressed that the Biden administration was not more active in responding. There is a way for Washington to forge a new security umbrella in the region that includes Israel, Egypt, and the Gulf states. It would stabilize the security environment, foreclose the prospects of a nuclear arms race in the region, and provide access to energy for the industrialized world. But that path would have to include making up with Mohammed bin Salman. I don't make this argument lightly. Jamal Khashoggi was my friend. In fact, when I visited Saudi Arabia in 2004, he was my companion and guide. I miss him dearly even now. But the fact of the matter is, MBS is likely to rule Saudi Arabia for the next 50 years. He is an absolute ruler like all his predecessors, but within the country, he is viewed as a modernizer and is extremely popular with Saudi youth for curtailing the power of the religious police, opening up the country to entertainment and tourism and giving women greater freedoms. Most of those who advocate continuing the ostracism of MBS do not explain when or how it will ever end, leaving U.S.-Saudi relations in a permanently frozen dysfunctional state. 
International relations are often about choosing strategy over ideology. During the Cold War, Washington made common cause with Mao's China, among many unsavory regimes, to put pressure on the Soviet Union. If Washington wants to prevail in this new Cold War with Russia, it needs to be similarly strategic in its outlook. Go to CNN.com slash Fareed for a link to my Washington Post column this week. And let's get started. Today marks 60 days of Putin's war in Ukraine. This week, Russia began an offensive in the Donbass region, and the military revealed its goal was to assert full control over the south of the country. But the Ukrainian resistance is strong. They remain in control of certain key cities, and President Zelensky expressed confidence that Ukraine would defeat Russian forces now that his pleas for arms have finally been answered. I wanted to get an assessment of this new Russian offensive and of Ukraine's ability to counter it. I'm joined by CNN military analyst General Mark Hurtling. General, the Russians have put an enormous amount of firepower and manpower, and you can see it in the ravaging of a town like Mariupol. Um, is Russia going to prevail because of that, just the sheer force of that Russian firepower? You know, Fareed, the, the Russian artillery is in great quantity, and quantity has a quality all of its own. Uh, but I believe, based on what they're attempting to do in this new phase of the operation, that Ukraine is prepared to conduct counter-artillery fires, as well as to maneuver forces to counter any activity along three very distinct axes of advance that Russia has, has actually compressed their operations into. Uh, you know, you're talking about three zones of operations from Kharkiv southeast into the Donbass, uh, from the north and east of Zaporizhia into the Donetsk Oblast, and in the Kherson Mikolaev axis along the Black Sea. They're attempting, the Russians are attempting to tie down the reserves of the joint force along these several axes. A and at the same time, they're going to continue this long range harassing missile fire and rocket fire into some key major cities which they have no intent of taking right now. It's just to uh, deflect the, the attention of the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military to help save their, their civilian population. How should we think about Mariupol, which seems to be, I mean, the city seems completely destroyed. Um, wh what is the, you know, can, can Ukraine hold out? Well, they, they've done an unbelievable job in terms of the forces that are in the city holding out against three different axes of advance by Russian forces. It has been, from a military perspective, from my observations, a phenomenal uh, siege operations by the Russians, but they have failed just because of the will of the Ukrainian fighters that are inside uh, that plant. Uh, those fighters, those Ukrainians, have held up a, a large amount of Russian forces in an area that both sides need. That, the town of Mariupol, that once very large port city, has roads, railroads, and in fact rivers going in different directions, and it's a key logistics hub. And as we get into this phase of the fight, logistics will be the most important aspect of this attrition warfare. Mark, you told me uh, privately that there was a distinction between Ukraine uh, or Ukrainian effort to defeat the Russian army versus destroy the Russian army. We have about a minute. Can you just briefly explain that vital distinction? Yeah, both of those terms have doctrinal definitions in the military, Fareed. Defeat means that it, defeat takes away the ability of a force to continue their operations. They can no longer either supply themselves, man their force, move and fire. Destroy means that they can no longer contribute to any kind of fight, even from a stationary position. That the force is so depleted and destroyed that it can no it no longer poses a threat to their enemy. So those are the things I'll be looking for. And and we saw a, a, a defeat of the Russian forces in the northern sector. What I'm seeing the potential for is Ukraine to destroy the remaining forces of the Russian army army with the kind of artillery forces. But there's a danger in that too. It will put Mr. Putin on the true horns of a dilemma if he no longer has a security force to execute 
his, uh, his desires and his strategic objectives.